um, and as a newer story was was a, a guy that really struggled um, with with alcohol and, and addiction there and so you know he'd go three months without selling I mean we you know had to stop his contract a couple of times and everything and I knew where he lived and I go find him and I go do this and got him involved at our church and in a halfway house and, and all of these things to help fix him and he's become just an incredible human being he's become one of my closest friends Mr. James Whitley welcome to Spring Vegas dude we love you so much thank you for coming in man thank you for having me it's been I think three years yeah. yep last time you're here we we're in that other building in a little tiny office with me and Lindsay now you it's have a little one bit, office exactly now you have a whole building it's a little different um, but dude I just want to just for those of you that don't know James right James is one of the OG FE telesales guys you run an extremely successful FE shop you guys have how many agents now I think we're getting close to 300. Yep. And then y'all's premiums are incredible. But what I want to talk about is less business. I think everybody knows you by now because you've been around the brand. I've done several videos. There's other videos that you guys can watch, you know, if you want to see more in-depth, like, sort of business stuff. What I want to talk about is what James and his group do really uniquely, which is they have the insurance vertical nailed with FE Tail Sales, but more so... The stories that you hear from James and, and Grant and all these guys at the top of SLS is about the people and the lives that have been changed and how they've used this business to change lives specifically. You are not, um, you know, separate from that particular sort of, you know, momentum of creating success, but your success isn't necessarily to acquire, you know, stuff in a lifestyle. You're, what is your success about? What drives you, man? Um... It's definitely evolved, you know, over time. And I think, you know, we've known each other for a long time, so we've talked about it. And, you know, what what gets me up every single morning has been oftentimes what we talk about, which is, you know, my family, um, being able to provide for them. Um, I think I told you the story before, you know, uh, Matt Monero was a guy that, that I met actually the same weekend I met Cody in person. I knew who Cody was, but uh, met him at 10 X and got to do a little private breakout with him and just talking about, you know, his book, which you need more money sounds super, you know, shallow and surfacey on, on the top end. But when you actually dive into it and read and get to know him, you know, he talks a lot about his family and, you know, some issues that they had health wise and family wise and stuff. And that really rang with me because, you know, my goal at the time was to retire my mom who had a pacemaker and was working, you know, at the hospital, you know, way more hours than she should. Um, and I was able to accomplish that goal. But then, you know, along the way, uh, my wife, when my first son was born, um, had some serious health issues come up. And that really kind of put things into perspective. And for those that have had medical, you know, issues or treatment issues, know how expensive that stuff is. Um, and so that really drives me because I just don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know what tomorrow holds. And I never want to have to be in a place where I have to decide between like putting food on the table or doing some medical treatment. And a lot of things we've tried, you know, aren't necessarily covered by, by insurance. So. Well, and, and you're, you know, the, the amount of pressure that you have on you as a man, as a father of your, of your home is a lot. Um, you know, the actual uh, medical bills are not small that you have to deal with, right? Yep. And so, you know, it, it ends up being one of those situations where you're so focused on work to be able to provide for that particular, you know, area of your life. How do you balance the, because you work a lot, you're very successful by doing so. How do you balance the, the is there such a thing as work-life balance? Let's talk a little bit about this because you and I have a lot of discussions, I think, regarding, you know, people will kind of like give you a hard time for working too hard sometimes. But like, I want to talk about that because there's a balance there. It's like, yeah, you might put in your 80 hour weeks, but like you have, there's a bigger purpose here. How are you able to sort of walk that line, keep that balance? And then what do you say to those people that say, James, you work too much, you need to give your family more attention or whatever they want to say? Right. Um, one of the biggest mentors in my life, Rory Dockard, you've met him. He, he owns SLS and, and took me under his wing and all that stuff. And I learned early on his son, Grant's my best friend and, and got me into the industry too. He talked early on about how when he was raising his kids, he missed a lot of family dinners. And, and I think a lot of times people think the work-life balance is I got to be home for dinner and I got to do all this. And I don't argue with people that, that think that's important. And I try and have as many dinners with my family as I can. But he talked about how the insurance industry allowed him to be the only parent 
in his children's high school. There, he's got two boys, so over a six-year span, he was the only parent that didn't miss a single sporting event, whether home or away. And so he was able to drive two and a half hours to a basketball game in Belle Glade or, or different places. And that really resonated with me because I remember, you know, growing up and playing sports and, you know, parents not being able to make everything um, and doing that. And I am 24-7. My agents know I'm 24-7. You know I'm 24-7. I can respond to a phone call or a text. And so part of, I think, what's been important for me is, is keeping my family involved, maybe not quite as involved as, as you getting to work with with your wife and, and that's awesome but keeping them involved with everything I do so my son's only five but when agents call I make sure that he knows who those agents are and so even if we're doing Legos like I can FaceTime Justin or, or sure. Crystal or somebody and he knows their names he knows who they are and he likes talking to them and so therefore I can be present in two places at one time and and for me that, that really works. I bring my son to the office with me. He loves going and loves doing stuff like that. So I try and get them as involved as possible in, in what I do. And I think that helps a lot. I think it's it comes down to leadership. Um, I, in my family, I'm the leader of my household, right? As, I'm, as the man, I'm, I'm in charge of providing, but also leading. I have three kids. I've got a little girl that needs more of my attention than my boys do. Um, and I work a lot, but I also like don't necessarily like like, okay, so you might say that, like, we don't do a lot of home dinners, like, during the week. So we'll go to out to eat or whatever. But then, like, during the weekend, I'm, like, cooking and grilling and having that time at the lake and all that. And it's, like, to me, I think that you can still work your butt off and not have to make – it's, like, th- th- like I get so annoyed when I hear people say, like, you know, I just miss those times to be able to throw a football back and forth with my son. It's like, you know, you just didn't make that time and using the work as an excuse. Yes. There's plenty of time. You know what I'm saying? Like there's plenty of time, trust me. And so I feel like that's a cop out a lot of times is for people to, because the insurance industry specifically is very performance production oriented, right? It's very simple. You make more dials, you're going to be more successful. You have more time to make more dials, you're going to be more successful. So there's going to be some sacrifice. But, you know, some of your agents, you know, just to, to, to get into some of your top tier people, Crystal, can we talk about her for a minute? Yeah. So she just built her own brand new house in Florida, right? But she also works, what, 80 hours a week and just crushes, 60, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week and just crushes. She's the last one off the phones, right? T- tell us a little bit about Crystal and her work ethic and how that work ethic has allowed her to sort of accomplish the things she wants as well. It's, you know... It's interesting when you when you talk about that stuff and, and it gets into deeper conversations that some people aren't comfortable having. Um, and, and you talk about making that time for, for different things. And so when when she first started, you know, she, like a lot of us, I think, in sales, struggled with some addiction, you know, issues and some different stuff there. And so part of what I think, you know, the family that, that we've got at SLS has provided her as a place to channel those addictions into positive places and into healthy things. And, you know, and then in turn, she's reciprocated that. And so by, you know, making her, you know, addiction sales and clients and then now building a team, you know, she's able to then pour back into her own, you know, agents and her own team, just like I was able to for her. And so by having this house and being able to have them come over and, and hang out with her and do all that stuff, but, you know, idle hands or or the devil's playground right and so for her it's like if she's not spending time with her friends or not spending time you know my kids call her aunt crystal and she's involved in their lives and all that stuff but if she's not doing that stuff similar to me similar to you then she's filling that time with with work and and she's got big goals and she wants to accomplish them can we provide a little bit of context for those that don't know crystal we i've had crystal on our channel before Mm -hmm. um she's one of your poster you know, child agents that's just super successful. What, brag on Crystal for a second, her production, her calls, just real quick, just so they know what's going on. Um, going on eight years now, and uh, we have a contest called the Ultimate Challenge um, where every six months, you know, the, the top agent, sales agent, numbers-wise, um, wins out of, out of the whole agency, and, and they get a cash uh, prize. And she's won that, I think, seven times now. Um, and... On average, each year sells anywhere from six to seven hundred and fifty thousand um, of annualized premium on her own pen, um, and now her team is is approaching two million dollars uh, in sales on top of that. Um, and she is just a beast, and she's one of those people where you know we provided her an opportunity and a place to fit in, but she just 
doesn't have an off switch. And so she just goes and goes and goes. So. Can we talk about the soil that allows that type of flower to grow in? How have you been able to, because I think that's what anybody that's building a team, you know, always is looking for those individuals. Um, what, did, what, what have you guys done at SLS to create that sort of soil that allows her and those like her to be successful? Because she's not the only one that's crushing like that. You have several, several agents that are crushing like that. So give me a couple talking points of how you've been able to do that. We talk, you know, a lot at SLS about, and this ties into what we're talking about with, with family and the stuff that, that drives me. We talk a lot about like the why that makes you try and, and the why that makes you cry and understanding that sales can't be talked about in a vacuum, especially with sales individuals. Um, to really get into sales and really be addicted to sales, you know, you've got to maybe be slightly off kilter. And and so to find those things and to channel those things and to work on, you know, you've been to the office, you know, we've, we've got, you know, a joke around there in my office. I've got a couch and a couple of chairs and it's the Dr. Phil yep. area. And we spend more time probably on any given day talking through uh, people's, you know, issues and problems and stuff, because as much as some of us are able to compartmentalize and leave stuff at home, the majority of people are struggling at, at their job or their career, not because they're not good at it, but because they've got something going on outside of it, whether it's, you know, personal issues or family issues or, you know, depression or addiction or something like that. And so we make sure that everyone knows that, that, you know, our office and SOS and, and, and us as, as people, it's a safe place to come. It's a safe place to open up and talk about these things and be able to get, you know, help and input and support, you know, as much as they want. And by, you know, doing that, when you talk about soil, now you've, you've created the proper foundation so that you can then, you know, build that career and, and really run with it. And so Crystal and a lot of our agents are, are incredible examples of that. Um, and all we did was give them a safe place to come to. So, Have you ever heard of Price's Law? I just recently heard about this. Mm -hmm. In every sales organization, they teach this in like Harvard business classes. Um, it's called Price's Law. What it states is, is that 50% of your sales production will come from the square root of your total salespeople. So if you have nine salespeople, 50% will come from three of those individuals. If you have 25 um, uh, people, then... 50% uh, will come from five of those individuals. It's not just like a thought that this little, you know, group figured out. It's like you extrapolate that over all the sales teams in the history of the world. It's always basically coming down to about those averages. One of the things that I want to talk about, just you've been very successful running a sales team, a sales floor, creating the marketing that it takes to run that. Also, the personalities that it takes to run that. How many agents do you think you've hired at this point? A thousand? Two thousand? Five thousand? As an agency, yeah, probably. You know, we're, we're in the thousands. I mean, SLS has been around for for fifty years now. It's our fiftieth anniversary yep. here. Um, me personally, yeah, a couple couple thousand probably. At least that we've given the opportunity sure. to. So let's back to Price's Law. Do you feel like that is true? If you think about that, just on the surface level, without digging too far in, that fifty percent of your production will come from the square root of your actual sales force. Yeah, it's it seems kind of like the eighty twenty, um, you know, uh, issue too. Um, but I think sometimes, and and I struggle with this, is I see potential in everybody, sure. and so even the person that is at the bottom and struggling, you know, I, I feel like if I can just figure out what's causing those problems and what's causing those issues, then then we can, you know, correct that and can fix that because some of our most successful people weren't that successful when they first started, um, but. The hardest part is just getting people to to want it and to try and, and to show up. And that's I can't teach work ethic. Sure. You know, I can try, but I can't. And a lot of times I think that top, let's call it 20 percent or that top. Let's just say on a normal sales team of, of nine people, those top three people. I think it's normal for those three people to kind of rotate in and out depending on life circumstance throughout the year. But the whole point of me bringing this up was and I just want to talk with you as a person that runs a huge sales floor. And I also have 15 guys. Um, I'm, what he was trying to tell me when I was learning about this prices law, I was watching this whole thing on it. Um, he said what people try to do is they try to basically take, they try to fight against prices law and they just can't. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to make the, of the, my nine sales team example, we've got six people that are doing 50% of the production. You got three people that are doing the other 50%. They say it's very difficult for you to, to get those other six to produce like the top 
three, no matter what. So you just mentioned that you like trying to bring them up. Can you give me any insight in your opinion on I, what I'm learning is, is that it might be more successful for the overall organization to make sure that, because their whole point was fight for those three, do everything you can to keep those three. Not that you're not caring about the six, but make sure you understand that like, it's just a general theory and a rule that those three are going to be pr- providing 50% of your production. So I thought of you because Crystal wasn't always a, a gem, right? For you guys. I know her production was there, but then she would disappear sometimes for a little bit. And you're like, what the heck's going on? But you were the guy that took the effort to make an extra step for her. Do you have some of that story? Would you mind sharing us with some of those stories? If you're comfortable? Yeah. Um, it's, it's I guess, seeing potential in people and, and understanding that. And, and like I said, a lot of what makes success, at least in the sales agents that, that you know, we have and stuff is that addictive tendency. You know, I've got it. Um, and I know a lot of them do. And so trying to work through that. And so, you know, without going into too much detail, you know, she um, – had a couple of run-ins with the law that, that, you know, I got involved with, um, in order to try and help her and try and, you know, write that ship and mentor her and, and, uh, even went to court with her one exactly. day and, and did those things because I care about her as a person. And, and I make sure that a lot of these people know, and, and Crystal knows this if, if she's watching that if she never made another sale for the rest of her life, like she's still part of my family sure. and I still care about her sure. um, and, and what she does. And, and to counteract a little bit on that prices law thing is also, it's hard from a sales organization standpoint to understand, right? And we all struggle with this is not everybody wants to be a crystal. And so, you know, we've got people that, that perennially are winning these contests and doing all this stuff, but we have just as many people that, you know, are in the middle of the pack, at least for us, as far as, you know, the career agency that we focus on, that couldn't be happier because, you know, their spouse works full time and they're able to plug into a system where, you know, there are no hours and there are no requirements, you know, with how we work. Um, and so if their level of success is to make, you know, whatever that number is, you know, $52,000 a year and have the unlimited flexibility going back to what we talked to, to be able to go pick up their daughter at three o'clock and not have to ask for time off when they want to go to Disney on a Friday or something. I've got an agent that, that I think about all the time that, you know, she couldn't be happier doing what she's doing here because it provides her unlimited freedom. Um, and so she's just as successful in her own right. And I'm just as happy that we provided that success. She's made more money than she's ever made, but her definition of success isn't going to put her in that, that top, you know, um, you know, 30% or, or whatever that number is. So, um, it's interesting from that standpoint and it's tough because some people just want to push, 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 push. So. What I was, what I guess maybe the point I'm trying to make, and I'm not doing a very good job at it, is that you were doing the right thing by caring about Crystal as a human. Yeah. And it wasn't just her production that you cared about. And you went above and beyond. You did everything you could do to keep Crystal around, to help her, support her, make her feel loved, et cetera. I guess my point is, is that Harvard Business books tell you that that's also the most financially uh, smart decision as well. And you didn't even, you weren't even looking at it like that, right? So it's like no surprise that all of a sudden you've got this organization that's thriving because you've always been the guy that's invested in your people always and then try to bring those that aren't in the 30% into that 30%. But but you'll, you guys do everything you can to keep those individuals. It's just funny to me where it's like you think that it's like, well, I'll just be a good person. And, and it's almost like sometimes it's like doing the right thing and being a solid businessman sometimes can feel in conflict and they're not. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They don't have to be. And here's numbers that even share. You know, like every time I, I tell the story, I'll have to tell it again. The first time I met you and Grant, you guys took me out to uh, the country club that you guys golf at. And uh, we were having dinner. And it was, I was new in the industry. I was probably eight months in. And I'd sat with a bunch of successful people. And everybody wants to tell me how successful they were and how many sales they got and how many sales guys they have. And their numbers and their premium and their exit strategy, et cetera. And you and Grant just talked over and over and over. Is it Maisha? Is that Mika? Mika, Mika. Those types of stories. You went through and picked her up from her job was a KFC like server, right? Like working the window. 
like, hey, you, you can do more with your life, you know? And you told me about Crystal. And you told me, I mean, there was like seven or eight. And we spent the first 30 minutes talking about the stories and the people that you impacted. Has that always been, like, where did that come from, man? Like, why did you, did you, that's not normal. And how did you, was it, was it Rory's mentorship combined with your personality and you and Grant? I mean, what was it that caused you guys to do things differently before most people? And then here you are with, I think, probably one of the more successful final expense shops in the country. I don't know of too many that are bigger than you. Uh, there's probably a handful, but um, you're in the top five, that's for sure. And it's because you guys did things differently. Why? Why did you think so differently from the beginning? I'd like to think, you know, it's just in, in my character. Uh, but to your point, you know, when I look back at it now, uh, Rory was, was the one that instilled that in me because that's how he was. So to, you know, I know we've, told my story before but but 13 years ago 2009 James Whitley is not this James Whitley you know I was I had no confidence I was broken because you know I'd been laid off so many times the recession was in full swing I'm living at home with my parents I'm I'm drowning in debt and Rory didn't see any of that he just said you know he had been successful already in insurance he could I say this time and time again we had a, a call you know, yesterday morning on Zoom, side story for, you know, Labor Day for, for agents that wanted to work, come on and get some motivational stuff. Rory's on there and Rory knows everybody's name. They could have been there a week. He knows what they, you know, sold yesterday. He genuinely cares. He genuinely wants them to be successful. 45 years later, he's still focused on that. And he did that for me. Like there, there was no potential in me. I didn't have any six pre- previous success. I, you know, he saw something in me and it wasn't easy. Like the first couple of years, like I'm sure he lost money on, on me. And, and then, you know, Grant graduates and he comes down and we're trying to figure out how to sell this stuff. And again, you know, you look at 13 years later and where we're at, but we didn't get Mika or Latouris or, you know, Ronald or Crystal or some of those anchors until eight years ago, seven years ago. So there was a lot of times where he just kept believing in us and he would take me out to lunch and do these things where I just thought he was being nice. But I realized he was trying to teach me stuff and trying to train me and trying to to believe in me and help me with life stuff. And I would go to him if I had issues with, you know, my wife and I were just dating at the time or when my kids were born or anything like that. He's always the guy I can turn to. And so he's like a father figure to me. And so he taught me more about that than he did about selling because he was always honest. He's like, I never sold over the phone. So here's how I sold in person. But that's all I can teach you. And so I think it instilled it with me and without me realizing it. And, and, you know, that's just what I started doing with people. So when we hire these people, we just saw potential and we said, let's try and maximize that. How do you identify? Because obviously I know I know a lot of your leaders um, in your organizations and they all kind of have that. They seem like they're kind of cut from the same cloth a little bit. So it sounds like you have a pretty solid process of identifying that potential leader. Can you walk me through just a, um, a, a practical approach of how are you going to identify your next leader? And then what are you going to do differently for that individual, potentially? I wish I knew how to just spot them right out of the blue, because then this would be way easier. You know, so I'm, I'm, I always say I'm wrong just as much as I'm right, um, sometimes even more. But, you know, you only have to be right a couple of times. Uh, but I think sometimes people construe sales success within leadership. And so your number one salesperson won't always be your best leader. Uh, but there are some people that I think, again, finding what drives people. And so what gets me up in the morning, we talked about family stuff, but what gets me up every single morning and gets me to still run a a call every single day and do all this stuff isn't money. It isn't success. It isn't fame or fortune. It is thinking about those agents who have never made more than 17,000, 24,000 or whatever, or come from a broken home or have a chip on their shoulder or recovering from addiction and knowing that if I show up today and give it 110%, then they have a chance to change their life and be successful and and then have that butterfly effect. And so finding people, and, and you see it in people early on, that feel the same way. And so oftentimes we have people that don't sell that much because money is not the motivation, but then you give them some responsibility and you give them some some leadership and all of a sudden they blossom into something different because now that's what's driving them more so than the, the sales numbers or, or the deposits in their bank account. So. so you 
once again, I'm, I'm just making sure that you guys understand that this dude probably runs the most successful sales organization in final expense right now. And so I'm going to try and pick out a little wisdom from you because you're the guy that you're their operational guy, right? It comes through you. You identify the leaders and you are very successful at doing so in Vero Beach on that, on the sales floor because you all have a beautiful building in Vero Beach. Um, can you walk me through just a couple quick KPIs? So let's just say you've got someone that has that potential, but they aren't um, finding that success that you know they're capable of. How does that conversation go? Where does it ha- I want to know details. Where does it happen, first off? What's the tone? Paint me a picture. Do you, do you pull up their production? Do you have a, like, walk me through, let's just say, walk me through. If I'm a guy that you think has potential and you think I care and you're going to take the effort to pull me aside, how is that meeting going to go? architecturally i think it's it's something that you see you know where you know again our <clears throat> i appreciate all the accolades our leadership team does a fantastic job right so you've got rory who might notice something in somebody or grant <clears throat> excuse me or <clears throat> or uh you know henry stewart um who's our president of sales or somebody recognizes something in somebody and because we are like a, the the way our organization is run and the way the sales team is run what you see usually more often than not is somebody that selflessly is is offering to help somebody else. So, you know, you have to pay attention to what's kind of happening in the shadows, I guess, where somebody that's struggling, you find out that so-and-so reached out to them or somebody was, you know, trying to close a sale and somebody jumped in to help them or somebody was answering, constantly answering underwriting questions in, in, a, in a group chat or something like that. And so, usually one of us will pick up on that or identify that and say, wow, this person's being so helpful in helping these other peoples and maybe they're not sh- you know, shining on their own. Now, some of them do shine on their own as well, but it's just finding you know, those different things. And, and the, I think it just stands out. You know, the, the cream rises to the top um, more often than not, as long as you're, you're realizing what you're looking for. You know, and it's like we said, it's just not always numbers that, that tell you those things. Okay. Well, paint me a picture though on how that conversation goes. I want to know, I want to sit in the seat to be coached by you a little bit. Like, give me a minute, like of what you would, would you pull up their production numbers? Would you look at their KPIs? Look at their talk time? If we're talking about moving into like leadership? Not necessarily. Just, I want you to be successful at whatever level that is. Right. And let's just say they're not being successful. What do you and your leaders do to help them get to the point of more success? Obviously statistics is always my my obsession right what are your I, go-tos? I i um focus a lot on activity right and so we we talk a lot about dials and talk time um because that's what a telesales organization will run on and so it's it's trying to figure out how to make that correlation do they need you know more you know accountability right do they need to be you know in in some sort of accountability group we've got all kinds of accountability that, that we offer to different people throughout that um is it something going on outside of work you know and so when we sit down we can say here are your numbers because all of us myself included sometimes will think we're doing more than than we really are and so numbers don't lie at its core um, but by showing the numbers usually you know spending some time getting to know somebody and understanding those things and pointing out the positives right and so if somebody i think has more potential than they're showing it's figuring out, okay, what is their, you know, dollars per dial, for instance, right? Like how much are they making every time they dial a number? And maybe if we can just change how they're looking at that, right? And so now we can gamify it. So, so many guys get, you know, the dopamine of, of playing video games, all this stuff. And it's like, hey, the more times you you reach out and, and hit this button, then the, the more chances you have to make it. And so if they're money driven, then we can tweak it from that standpoint. If they're, you know, freedom driven or they're this or they're that, but it's always got to find out what makes them tick. And so, you know, we, we were talking this morning about, you know, everyone in sales, no matter who they are, talks about the, the need to have a warm up, right. And the need to build rapport. But then sometimes we skip that with salespeople. And so it's like, hey, we still got to find some common ground, find that connection and find what what motivates them. And that's what I was trying to, to get to earlier is you can turn somebody off by pushing them to do more if they're happy with where they're at. And so there's that fine balance between I'm trying to help them discover that. And oftentimes that happens over time because some of those success stories we talk about in the beginning, 
if you're frying chicken at KFC and the most you ever made is 27,000 and now you can make 40,000 working half the hours, there might be a gap of time there where you're not working as hard as you could because you've never made $40,000. Sure. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm in the, yeah, I get it I totally. Got, I got yeah. cash in the bank all of a sudden, yeah. you know, and now we're showing off and we go buy new clothes and we go buy a new car and all that stuff. But, um, like Henry Stewart's got a line he always uses that sticks in my head. He says there's, it's a watch reference for watch people. There's levels to these bezels. And so he talks about the fact that like now all of a sudden that person comes back or Mika's the one, like all of a sudden she was like, okay, like with more money comes more, like now I don't want to rent anymore. I don't want to live in the neighborhood I want to. I want to buy a house. I want to be the first person in my family to buy a house. I want to be the first person to buy a new car. Now they can come to me with those goals. And so you create that open door policy to where they can come and sit down and say, here's now what I want to accomplish. I told you last year, it was just this. Now here's where we want to be. Now we can really break down the numbers because now we figured out, okay, here's what the, here's, here's what the end game is. Here's what I want to, to accomplish at the end of the year. And now we can back into those numbers. And, and I've told you before, what am I, I might be dating myself for younger viewers, but I have a TPS report. Um, that, I love that the I reference. Down. And um, so if you haven't seen Office Space, go watch it. It's a great movie. But uh, I made a TPS report just because it makes me laugh. But it was um, T stood for talk to. How many people did you talk to? P stands for presentations. S stands for sales. And so then you can you can now add in with, we didn't used to have CRMs back then. So you could add in dials and make it DTPS, but that's not as cool. But now I can see, okay, for every, I got to talk to 12 people to get a presentation. Um, and I got to do four presentations to get a sale, right? So now I know I got to talk to 48 people and then I can figure out how many dials it takes to get there. And if you give me three months worth of data and you tell me, here's what my income goal is, then I can back out what your activity needs to be. And that's something tangible that people can, can attach themselves to because too often people just say, well, I'm just going to work as hard as I can. It's like, well, that's cool. You know what I mean? It's like, if I walked into a room and said, who in here wants to be a a millionaire? Everyone's going to raise their hand, right? But then I say, okay, well, here's what's going to take to do that. Most people aren't going to want to do that. But if we can make a realistic goal and then show them based off of your statistics, here's what it'll take to get there. Then from a sales standpoint, that's, that's how you can really get the motivation. So can I ask you a um, management question? Mm -hmm. So you have leaders, how many leaders do you have in your organization of the 300? 20, 30? So yeah, 20 to 30, somewhere in there. So different levels of them. Your meetings are with those leaders, right? Or are you allowing your door to be opened by anyone on the, in the organization? Currently, I still haven't, you know, if, if people want to reach out, um, you know, whether they're in Bureau or they're on a different team, they're in Texas or Atlanta or whatever. I mean, I I really do have an open door policy, you know, from that standpoint, uh, because, you know, I I want to be accessible to, to everybody, um, from that standpoint, but part of, my mission now is to really train those other leaders, you know, in order to be able to do the same things that I do and see those same things. But, you know, that's, that's a tough thing to, to train from that standpoint, but you know, we're not a, we're not 15,000 agents, like a lot of these, you know, organizations out there. So I, I feel like I can still give the sure. time to those that want it. I just have, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, um, like I, I care so much that sometimes I can get too personally involved in situations. So what has happened over the years is I've rubber banded and I'll Heisman a lot of conversations that are in my organization that um, because I have sort of felt this consequence of potentially being too much of an open door. Um, and I'm trying to find this balance. And so it's like, I'm thinking like, cause I'm really, this is a weakness of mine cause I can be seen as cold and not available, um, but I would like to be more available to my leadership team and then train the leadership team to be available for their people. And I was wondering if you had done that mostly, or are you saying you're just available to the 300? Any uh, tips for me, I guess? This is a con- con- uh, counseling session from James to me. So what I've tried to get better at from a personal standpoint is when a agent has an issue and comes to me is if they're comfortable talking about in front of somebody else, bringing their direct, uh, you know, coach or, or leader in to the conversation so that they can see, you know, how we handle it and to understand that. 
but that's a slippery slope. And so it's from the opposite side of you, I tend to not have boundaries. And so it's, it's come back and, and it's still hard for me to talk about today, but, um, one of our leaders who's, who's a really close friend has become a really close friend of mine. Um, and as a newer story was, was a, a guy that really struggled, um, with, with alcohol and, and addiction there. And so, you know, he'd go three months without selling. I mean, we, you know, had to stop his contract a couple of times and everything. And I knew where he lived and I go find him and I go do this and got him involved at our church and in a halfway house and, and all of these things to help fix him. And he's become just an incredible human being. He's become one of my closest friends. Um, and, and we share a lot in common and his mission now is to help other people like him. And so we brought in another guy who was involved with his recovery process and long story short, um, you know, he was really down and out financially. And so I was helping him financially. I took him, he didn't have a car. I took him to the grocery store. I got him food. I, I put him up in one of my apartments, you know, and, and did all this stuff. And maybe some people would say went overboard. And, um, unfortunately a few months ago he relapsed, um, and overdosed and we lost him. And I was so intertwined in everything that went on there that, it blew back on me in ways I didn't think and emotionally or like financially or all the above, all of the above, Okay, you know, um, you know, and and I don't want to talk in too much details, but just some people that, that thought maybe I was responsible for some of that stuff and everything there. And, and, and it hurt because we had become really close and, and I never lost anybody. And so I spent a lot of time saying, what could I have done differently? What did I do wrong? And a lot of, counseling I've gone to and feedback and stuff is, is because maybe I didn't create boundaries and do all this stuff. And it's just hard because I can't save everybody and I can't fix everybody, but I want sure, to. Sure. And that's, and that's my addiction, right? So when we talk about our addictions, my addiction has become, I'm going to give another random reference, but if anybody used to watch lost, I got really into lost yeah, for a while. Me and, Lindsay and, did too. and Jack, the doctor, yeah. like his addiction was like, he needed to fix people. Right. And so if you remember, like there was that whole side story and and he and his relationship and stuff. And it was like he just needed as the doctor and the surgeon, he constantly was looking for people to fix. And I relate so much to that because sometimes I feel like I'm just looking for the next person to to fix. And and that can that can be dangerous, too. And that wears on my family and and different things there. Um, And so. I think there's two extremes to it, right? You can be too cold and reserved and not available. And then you can go to the extreme where, you know, you're involved in every aspect of the life. And so I'm trying to find the balance, but also trying to get the leaders involved to say, Hey, get involved with me early on so that we can have a conversation, come up with a game plan, come up with some goals and accountability. And then hopefully I can then hand that off to them to where, that person feels like I cared enough to get involved, but now somebody else is kind of managing the day to days. Cause I can't wake up every morning and text a hundred people and make sure they're okay and check in and make sure they're ready to go. Um, but I can, you know, try and teach other people how to do it. Um, and, and Henry spent a lot of time talking with me about that too. And he's helped me a lot from that standpoint of understanding if you focus too much on putting a fire down at the, at the bottom of the organization, you end up neglecting when we talk about the top, you know, neglecting the people that, the squeaky wheels going to get the grease, but, but these other people still need the attention. And so trying to train that next generation of leaders is helpful. Well, let's bring it to a close. Um, appreciate you, man. Love you, dude. You are a close friend. I just want to say thank you for your support friendship. You've been nothing but supportive on, you've done 8% stuff. You've been a client of security marketing for three years, three years. In fact, you were probably one of our first, I remember meeting you, at the first eight percent I was at, you were all dressed up like you always are. I'm like, who's this dude over here? He looks fun. And we talked and hung out. And then it wasn't too long after that that you came in and we did some business together. And uh, we've been doing business ever since. And I appreciate you and I appreciate your support. And one of the things that you know everybody needs a James in their life. Which what I mean by that is is you've always told me, hey, I love you and I love the work that you're doing and I appreciate um, the work. But like also like you know, let's be honest, I could do this from, for somewhere else, but like, I want to do it with you because I want to pour into your business and your organization. And I just can't tell you how much that's meant to me over the, over the years, because there's been a lot of times where this business is so performance-based mm. that sometimes it can be 
like there's very little grace given. So there's a lot of relationships that can kind of come in and out and not necessarily that they're even doing the wrong thing by exiting the relationship because the performance is better found somewhere else from a recruiting strategy or whatever. And that's totally cool. But you've always been extremely generous and you've always been extremely patient. You've always been extremely um, caring. You've always treated my team with respect. You've always treated everybody on my team loves James. So that's why you're the guy that gets the wine when you come to 8% and we're taking you to golf and and having fun because we're to this point now, James, where those relationships matter. And you used to always tell me early, Hey, when you get big enough, you're going to forget about me, dude. You are a brother and a friend. We ain't never forgetting about you. From the beginning, we've been um, friends, and, and I appreciate that. And I'm to the point now where we can kind of choose, kind of like you are, who we work with. And so it's just been fun. You've been a very consistent and steady mentor in my life of just bouncing some ideas off because you've accomplished um, a lot more than I have from a from a team size standpoint, from a, just a business acumen standpoint. You've been in this industry longer than I have. You said 14 years, right? Almost 14, yeah. 15. Yeah, um, and, and I, our kids are going to be hanging out. I, I really appreciate you as a friend and also as a client, and so thank you so much for taking some time to share some wisdom and hope you guys got some value out of this because this is the guy that you need to look up. Also, just to give you a quick plug, how do the people find you on social and just how do your people find you? Um, I am on Instagram. It's uh, James Whitley. I'm James Whitley on Facebook. Um, I'm not on TikTok. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm you could do some dances, now. bro. I know. I just got to figure it out. <laughs> um, so, so I'm on, I'm on, uh, you know, those platforms, um, for sure. And, and anybody can reach out to me. Sure. And senior life services, you guys do remote telesales now, final expense exclusively in the system that people can plug into your system is perfect for the individual. Look, there's, there's two types of insurance agents. There's entrepreneurs that need to be doing their own thing and finding their own contracts and find their own leads and going down that road. And then there's the individuals that are really just need a system to plug into a support mentorship leads. Um, like most importantly, like people that are alongside you that have already done this, you don't want to be that cavalier necessarily. And that's what SLS is really for, but you guys hire all across the country, right? Yeah, no, we've got, uh, agents and I think 37 States. Now we've got, um, coaches and, and incredible training and support. And, sure. and, and again, it's, you know, such a hot button word these days is entrepreneurship. Um, and you know, I like to, I'm trying to push in, uh, the, the keyword of entrepreneurship. And so while could I have been successful in the insurance industry on my own? Maybe I probably wouldn't have found it without Rory. And so providing a structure and organization where I could plug into and thrive and grow faster than I would have on my own and have somebody that financially supports me and does all that stuff. And, you know, we focus on just being able to sell and, you know, our back office and support staff and all that stuff is there. Um, and we've got, you know, incredible people at, at the leadership level with Rory Grant and Henry. And, and then, you know, we've got awesome people, you know, you've met and they've been on, you know, your show or other shows where you've got, you know, Jennifer Walker and Tanya Ferguson and Jason Torres and some of these people. And then your guy, you know, JVE, Justin, who, um, you know, has taken on his own role in the YouTube space and everything. And him and I realize we can plug in and have somebody that can support us and, and grow way faster. So it's been fun. I can't, I can't tell you how much I've seen that be the case in the industry. You know, 92% of insurance agents fail. So we end up hanging out with a lot of insurance agents. And the reason they fail is one of two things. They don't have the mentorship and the, the team to win with, or they don't have the opportunity to get in front of people on the leads. Um, and so those are the two things that you got to have. Um, there's a, hundred different ways to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And there's a hundred different verticals of insurance to figure that out in. So it's confusing. There's so much opportunity. However, it can be so much opportunity. I love Henry's example of it's like getting in that money tube where there's money flying around everywhere and you're trying to grab it with your hands. And then you get out of the tube and you got like two bucks and you're like, crap. You know what I'm saying? That's what the insurance industry is. And um, so I just, I appreciate you. I, I love Grant. I love Rory. I love you. I love Henry. I haven't spent as much time with Henry as I have the other three. Um, but, um, and then also you can always tell that your leadership and is, is awesome because the level below you, you got all your crystals and your Justins and your Jasons. These guys are people we golf with and have fun with and are friends with. So love you, buddy. Thank you for taking the time. Love you. Thanks for having me, man. All right.